Welcome to our verse-by-verse -verse study through the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. The first words in Genesis are, in the beginning. Genesis is a book of beginnings. It describes the beginning of the universe and everything in it. It also describes the beginning of God's relationship with mankind, how that relationship was broken by mankind's desire to do their own things, to go their own way, and also the beginning of God's plan to restore mankind back to the relationship that he created us for. In Matthew 22, Jesus tells us that the greatest thing that you can do with your life is to love God with your whole being and to love others. God created us to be the objects of his love and then poured his love into our hearts so that we could love him back and also love others. As we journey through the book of Genesis, we will learn more about the God who loves us and experience more of the blessings of his amazing love. So grab a cup of coffee, open your Bible to the beginning, to the book of Genesis, as we grow in our knowledge of God and his plan for our lives. Turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 27. Genesis 27, as we continue our study through the book of Genesis, title and series entitled The Beginnings. Ever hear someone say, that is not very Christian? Hopefully not to you, but maybe you've heard it. You know, unbelievers and believers have an expectation. They expect Christians to behave in a certain way. Now, very often their expectation is not based on, you know, the truth, not based on the Bible. It's just, you know, they have expectations. The reality is, is that as Christians, we should behave differently than the rest of the world. Would you acknowledge that, at least? That we should be different than, than the world is. But the other reality is, is that we will never be perfect. That, that as much as we might desire it, or, or even maybe even think we're you know, approaching it, the reality is, is we're not going to be perfect. And here in chapter 27 we're going to see a perfect storm of imperfect people acting imperfectly. This chapter can be very confusing because it appears that Jacob is going to get a blessing by lying through deceit. There's more to the story than that, and we'll get to it as we go through it. But ultimately, this message is about the wrong way to get God's blessing. That God has, God's promised blessings to us, he's promised good to us, and, and those promises are sure and true because God is sure and true, and that we can trust them. God is always faithful, he never goes back on his word, and we, so we can trust that. But the problem is sometimes we approach those promises, those blessings, as if we must do something to achieve them, that we must, that we must cause them to happen. So we're going to pray, and uh, I'm going to pray for, not just for this message, but just pray for us as, um, Lord, as the church has experienced, you know, a lot. There's a lot going on in the church right now, so let's take a moment and pray. Heavenly Father, we do lift the service up to you, and Lord, um, we're, going to, we're going to talk about the wrong way to get your blessing today, Lord, and, and I pray from that we can learn how, how we should be approaching your blessings, the ones that uh, you've promised to us, and and exceedingly great and precious promises have been made to us. And if we'll trust you, Lord God, that, that you'll bring them. You are going to bring them because your word says you will. And so I pray, Lord, that our hearts will be open to see if maybe somewhere in our own lives that we are interfering with uh, your promises. We're getting in the way of you fulfilling your promises your way. And so I pray, Lord God, that you would open our hearts to receive. But Lord, before we begin this message, Lord, my heart is heavy for, Lord, um, Lord, many in the church. Your word tells us, Lord, to rejoice with those who are rejoicing, and we do that as we rejoice with uh, David and Jamie, and they're moving into their new home. But, Lord, we also weep with those who weep, Lord, as we have several people in the church who have experienced loss with close, close family members, Lord God, and, and Lord, that, that is never easy. 
And so we pray, Lord, at the same time rejoicing on one side, weeping on the other, recognizing, Lord, that, um, Lord, that you are in the midst of all of it, as hard as it is sometimes to go through that. And so we pray, Lord, for those that need it, the strength and comfort and peace, Lord, of knowing that you are sovereign and that you are in control and that you care so much more than we can possibly imagine. I pray, Lord, for the, the, the hope that uh, comes through the gospel of Jesus Christ to all of those who need it. I pray for wisdom and strength and discernment. I pray for everything that we need, Lord God. If we will trust you, we'll, if we'll lean into you, Lord God, if, we'll, if we will know you through your word, that, Lord God, that, um, that all of these things, um, that none of them will move us, and that, Lord, whether it be good or bad, Lord God, that, um, that, that we can continue to walk, and we can do so boldly and with great courage and hope. So we thank you, Lord, for this day, what you're going to do in this message, and we pray it all now in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's something for you to meditate on this week, just in case, you know, you don't have anything to think about. Are God's blessings purely a function of his undeserved favor and grace, or do our actions play a role in God's blessing? So just meditate on that. I'm not going to give you the answer. I want you to meditate on it. I want you to think about it. I want you to pray about it. And I want you to seek it in God's word. But I'm going to talk a little bit about it in the message as well. So maybe you'll pick something up as we go through it. Genesis 27 might be the saddest chapter in the entire book of Genesis. Four people are mentioned. Isaac, Rebekah, Esau, and Jacob. None of them do the right thing. All four of them do the wrong things. They are all unfaithful. But even in their unfaithfulness, this chapter teaches us that God is faithful, even in the midst of his people's unfaithfulness. God is always faithful. It's a, it's a great comfort to me that God is faithful no matter what. He's, not, he's faithful when I'm unfaithful. He's unfaithful when the people around me are unfaithful. He's unfaithful in no matter what, cir- or he is faithful in no matter what circumstance, no matter what situation, no matter what my imagination might come with, he is always faithful. In the last chapter, we saw Isaac make the same mistake that his father made by not trusting God not trusting God to protect him, and lying about the, his relationship with his wife, Rebecca, referring to her as his sister. The Bible tells us that we need to be careful about the things that we do in our lives, that there is a consequence or there is a fruit that comes from our actions. What we sow is what we reap. It tells us in Galatians 6, 7, and 8. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Isaac lied. And we're going to see the main focus in this chapter is those around him lying to him. So he is going to reap the fruit of deceit in his life. Let's pick it up. Verse 1 of chapter 27. Now it came to pass when Isaac was old and his eyes were so dim that he could not see that he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son? And he answered, Here I am. Then he said, Behold now, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now therefore, please take your weapons, your quiver and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me, and make me savory food such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. Isaac is about 137 at this point. So when he says, I am old, he's old. There's no question about it. It's not as old as he's going to get because he'll actually live to be 180. He says, I'm not sure when I'm going to die. So, you know, I, I got to take care of my stuff right now. So he's, you know, he's basically being wise. I'm going to you know, set my affairs in order, even though he doesn't know he's going to live for another 43 years. It was a very, culturally, it's a very natural thing for him to do. 
you know, he is, he is distributing in advance his wealth and possessions. Not just that, but he's also, he's also dealing with the, the right of the, of the, of the firstborn, the, 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 um, the spiritual leadership of the family. He's passing on this mantle to his eldest son. He's passing on with that also the promises of Abraham and Isaac, the, the ones that God had made to Abraham and Isaac, he's passing those on to his oldest son. One problem with that, God had already spoken on this topic. And back in Genesis 25, he said this, verse 23, and the Lord said to her, that would be Rebekah, two nations are in your womb, two peoples shall be separated from your body, one people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Before Esau and Jacob were born, God said to Rebekah that, the, that that right of the firstborn is going to go to your second son, which was unusual. It was not normal, but God had already said that was going to happen. Now, either Isaac is having a senior moment here and has forgotten what God said, or he is choosing to do what he wants, choosing to do what culturally was natural rather than what God made clear to him in his word. We understand it because Esau was his favorite. It told us that previously. Just so you know, choosing favorites of your children never works out the way you think it will. Well, his plan does not go unnoticed. Verse 5. Now, Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son, and Esau went to the field to hunt game and to bring it. So Rebekah spoke to Jacob, her son, saying, Indeed, I heard your father speak to Esau, your brother, saying, Bring me game and make savory food for me that I may eat it and bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice according to what I command you. Rebekah knows what God has said to what God has planned. He knows that this passing on of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the firstborn's rights has already been promised to her son. And so she decides, okay, if that's what Isaac's going to do, I need to take matters in my own hands. I've got to deal with this myself before, you know, before you know, this goes the wrong way. Verse 9. Now, go now to the flock and bring me from there two choice kids of the goats and I will make savory food from them for your father such as he loves then you shall take it to your father that he may eat it and that he may bless you before his death and Jacob said to Rebekah his mother uh, look Esau my brother is a hairy man and I am a smooth skinned man perhaps my father will feel me and I shall seem to be a deceiver to him, and I shall bring a curse on myself and not a blessing. So, so Rebecca's response to, to hearing that Isaac is going to give the blessing to Esau is to deceive him into giving the blessing to Jacob, you know, to give the blessing that God had promised to him. Now, Jacob sees the obvious flaw in this plan, because, because Esau is a hairy man, and it literally means shaggy. So don't know exactly what was going on with him, but he was a hairy dude. And, and, and Jacob was a smooth-skinned man. Now, now, some have been taken that to mean that he was uh, you know, leaned toward the effeminate. That's not what it means at all. It just means he didn't have a lot of hair on his body, which, you know, you know that's just, that doesn't make you weak. It just makes you different. Notice his concern. His concern is that I shall seem to be a deceiver to him. Well, well, you are. Is what's going to That's what exactly what you're planning on doing. And he's concerned about his reputation, and not his character. Not a good look for the father of the twelve tribes of Israel, if you ask me. Mom says, don't worry about it. I got a plan for that too. Verse 13. But his mother said to him, let your curse be on me, my son, which it 
which it end up will be, only obey my voice and go get them for me. And he went and got them and brought them to his mother. And his mother made savory food such as his father loved. Then Rebecca took the choice clothes of her elder son, means his best clothes, of his elder son Esau, which were with her in the house because she was probably doing his laundry, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And she put the skins of the kids of the goats on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. And she gave the savory food and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. So he went to his father and said, my father, he said, here I am. Who are you, my son? Isaac is blind, but he's not deaf. And as soon as he hears that voice, he says, okay, wait a minute. Something's off here. Something's not quite right. One of the things you notice as we go through this, just about all of Isaac's senses are betraying him you know he just he, he he can't see we know he's blind that's already failed him his his ears his, his, his he can he can hear but he's not trusting what he's hearing and the smell and the taste and all this stuff because because his son is going out to get venison his his rebecca prepares goat and if you've ever tasted them they don't taste the same and so here he is being betrayed by all of his senses and ultimately common sense as well, which is what happens when you set out to live life your way. The very things you trust in will betray you one after another. And if you do not lean into God, you do not trust God, you do not trust his word, I can promise you the other things you're trusting in will betray you. They will fail you every single time who who okay i hear your voice but who are you verse 19 jacob said to his father i am esau your first firstborn i have done just as you told me please arise sit and eat of my game that your soul may bless me lie 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 one after another rapid fire lying now, the Bible tells us where lies come from. In John 8, Jesus speaking, You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Where do lies come from? Right straight from the devil. Which ones? All of them. The little little white lies, the half truths, all of it. Both Rebecca and Jacob may have felt justified. Can you imagine? They probably felt justified. You know what? God promised the blessing to Jacob. So, you know, so it's, it's okay if we do this. You know, it was Isaac. It's his fault. He was the one going against God. So we had to do this. Otherwise, God's will can't be done. In case you're wondering, deceiving or lying to help God is wickedness, is sin. God doesn't need you to sin to help him, right? Does that make sense? And God does not reward sin. Verse 20. But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? And he, this being, being Jacob, said, Because the Lord your God brought it to me. Ay, ay, ay. It's bad enough that Rebekah and Jacob have concocted this plan to deceive blind Isaac. But now they are making God in, complicit in their wickedness. They're accusing God. They're, they're making God a part of it, saying he's helping us. And this is a common tactic for those who want to justify living the way they want to live. I can't tell you how many times I've heard somebody say something like, well, if God didn't want me to do this, he wouldn't make, have made me this way. Hmm, that's not how it works. 
That's a twisted, corrupt logic that will lead to the greatest perversions and evil that we see. And very often, that's what we see people doing, saying, this is how God made me. So it's okay for me to be like this. It's okay for me to do this because this is how God made me. No. That's not, that's not why you're doing it. So Jacob's working really hard to convince his dad, but dad's still not convinced. Verse 21, And Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near that I may feel you, my son, whether you are really my son Esau or not. So he's not convinced that Jacob is Esau, well, because he's not. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, and he felt him and said, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. Here is his touches deceiving him or failing him. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands, so he blessed him. Then he said, are you really my son Esau? He said to him, I am. Verse 25, he said, bring it near to me and I will eat of my son's game that you, that my, so that my soul excuse me, may bless you. So he brought it near to him and he ate and he brought him wine and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, come near and kiss me, my son. And he came near and kissed him and he smelled the smell of his clothing and blessed him and said... Surely the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. Therefore, may God give you the dew of heaven, the, of the fatness of the earth, and the plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brethren and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be those who who bless you. There's, there's a ton wrapped up in that, but it goes all the way back to the promise that God made to Abraham, and we're going to see some of these things actually carried out later on as, you know, the whole idea of the sons bowing down to him. We're going to see, we're going to see some of that going on with, with, uh, with Joseph. We get to the story of Joseph and Joseph's brothers bowing down to him as that line just continues to ascend all the way through ultimately to Christ. All of Isaac's senses are failing him. Isaac, who just a few chapters ago, back in Genesis 22, was a type or a picture or an example of Christ. Here he is, an example of a backslidden man. A man who is thinking with his belly, thinking of savory meat, and thinking of, of, of doing things the world's way rather than God's way. And so he proclaims this blessing over Jacob. Now, now, in all of these blessings that we see like this in Scripture, there is a divine prophetic element to it always. That, 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 you know, that when, when, they, when these pr blessings were spoken over children or people like this, that it was... It was a prophetic utterance. It was God speaking either something toward the future or toward the life of this person. Now, now we understand something. This was the blessing that Jacob was supposed to get. It was his. When all the way back, in, when before they were born, before, while the twins were wrestling in Rebekah's womb, God had already determined that Jacob was going to be the one through whom the blessings would pass. So this is his blessing. It's just not the way he was supposed to have obtained it. So Jacob gets his blessing, and he almost gets caught in the act of taking this blessing. Verse 30. Now it happened as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, that Esau's brother came in from his hunting. He also made savory food and brought it to his father and said to his father, let my father arise and eat of his son's game, that your soul may bless me. And his father Isaac said to him, who are you? So he said, I am your son, your firstborn, Esau. Verse 33, then Isaac trembled exceedingly and said, who? Where is the one who hunted game and brought it to me? I ate all of it before you came, and I have blessed him, and indeed he shall be 
blessed, saying that the blessing that I've given is certain, that, that it is absolute, it is complete, it is final. It cannot be taken back. Now, now Isaac may be having a spiritual awakening here as he recognizes, okay, something, something has happened. And this idea of trembling exceedingly is literally his body is just convulsing as, a, as, as, as he's recognizing that something terribly wrong has happened. And there's a sense as we get it, though it's not implicit in the text, there's a sense that we get that Isaac recognizes his, his mistake, that he, has, that he has made a mistake, though, though he never really confesses it. You know, he tried to have his own will, his own way, and God sovereignly overruled him. Did you know that God can do that? God can sovereignly overrule. You can, get, you can decide, you know what, I'm going to go do my thing. I'm going to do what I want to do. Did you know that God can overrule you and do what he wants to do instead? Or, or cause you to do what he wants you to do? He can. Verse 34. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with an exceeding, exceedingly great and bitter cry. It means he, he just, it, it, the idea of just a, a scream of desperation. And said to his father, bless me, me also, O oh my father. Esau's response is remorse. He's sad. He's, he's, he's upset by this. But it was lacking something. And the writer of Hebrews tells us what it was lacking. Hebrews 12, starting in verse 14. Pursue peace with all people, which no one will see the Lord. Catch that can't get too far off on this tangent, without holiness in your life, people will not see the Lord. Holiness is a function. It's how people see God in you. Continue on. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright for you know that afterward when he wanted to inherit the blessing he was rejected for he found no place for repentance though he sought it diligently with tears what isaac lacked excuse me what esau lacked was repentance he had remorse but no repentance and that's not uncommon you see people when, when something happens in their life and they, and they get to this place of brokenness. They get to a place of brokenness, but it's an emotional brokenness that does not contain repentance. They're not, they may be sad that they've been caught. They may be sad that they're experiencing the consequence of something, but there's no sense of sinning against God, no sense that they have failed to keep God's perfect will. And they, have, they don't care. They just care that they didn't get what they wanted or they had to experience some negative consequence. And that's what's going on here. He's upset. He's got the, these tears of remorse, but without repentance. And, and I'm going to tell you right now, tears of remorse without repentance do not move the heart of God. He will not notice. These are the tears of a petulant, self-indulgent man-child. And God is not going to listen. Verse 35. But he said... He being Isaac, your brother came with deceit and has taken away your blessing. And Esau said, is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright and now look, he has taken away my blessing. And he said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? That's a typical response of someone who is is motivated and, and walking in the flesh he blames someone else. Esau blames Jacob for his problems. We remember, go back. You know, how did he lose his birthright? He sold it for a bowl of stew. He was hungry. He didn't care. He despised it, the Bible says. He despised his birthright, and now he's upset because he lost the blessing that was attached to that birthright. So now he, he starts off with remorse, and now he moves into resentment, and that's very common also. But when, we, when someone is, 
fails to repent, fails to get to that place of brokenness before the Lord, and, they, and some negative consequence comes from their, from their choosing to live the way they want to, and, and they, they're upset about it, they're sad about it, and it almost always turns into resentment. They, they look toward someone to blame. Not taking responsibility. Verse 37. Then Isaac answered and said to Esau, Indeed, I have made him your master and all his brethren. I have given to him as servants with grain and wine. I have sustained him. What shall I do now for you, my son? And Esau said to his father, Have you only one blessing, my father? Bless me also, me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Then Isaac, his father, answered and said to him, Behold, your dwelling shall be of the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven from above, which speaking of he will be prosperous. Verse 40, By your sword you shall live and you shall serve your brother, and it shall come to pass when you become restless that you shall break his yoke from your neck. It speaks also, the sword speaks of violence, and, he, and we see, we'll see that, that, that Esau ultimately will, you know, he also has the name Edom back in chapter 25. That was one of the other names that was attached to Esau was Edom. From Edom came the Edomites, and the Edomites were, were terrible enemies of the Jews for generations after that, including to the time of Christ. Herod the Great was an Edomite, and, and he remember, he killed all the babies two years old and under, all the boys in Bethlehem. Because there was no repentance, he had remorse, which ultimately turned into resentment, and then it turns into something else. Verse 41. So Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. So he goes from remorse to resentment to resolve. He resolves in his heart that as soon as dad dies, I'm killing him. Little does he know that dad's going to hang around for another 43 years. Everything changes within that 43 years, but we'll get to that when we get to it. Verse 42. Re Rebecca, Rebecca had an ear to the ground. It, nothing happened in that house that Rebecca didn't seem to hear about it. So not sure what was up with that, but she hears everything. And the words of Esau, her older son, were told to Rebekah. So she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said to him, Surely your brother Esau comforts himself concerning you by intending to kill you. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice. Arise, flee to my brother Laban in Haran, and stay with him a few days until your brother's fury turns away from you and he forgets about what you have done to him and I will send you and bring you from there why should I be bereaved also of you both in one day meaning she knows that if if Esau kills his brother that ultimately they're going to she's going to lose Esau as well and Rebecca said to Isaac I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth these are the two two um, women that her that Esau married who were who were from who were Canaanite women? He was she. They were a, they were a, a a burden to her heart. They grieved her heart. If Jacob takes a wife of the daughters of Heth, like these who are the daughters of the land, what good will my life be to me? The beginning of the next chapter, Isaac will send Jacob away. He's going to send him up to up to uh, Rebekah's brother's home, Laban, up in Padanaram. Little does she know that that'll be the last time she sees him. She says in the text that it'll be just a few days. It'll be 20 years before Jacob comes back. And before those 20 years are over, she will die. This chapter can be very confusing. It seems like Rebecca and Jacob get away with deception. They get away with lying. And that, and that Jacob gets this blessing. 
we have to keep in mind that what the context of this whole book is, Moses is writing at the time that the Jews are in the exile. They are or not in the exile. They are in, the, in that time. That they're out of Egypt, and they are in that time in the Exodus. Excuse me. They're in the Exodus. And so they're in the wilderness, and they're wandering around. And so he's writing this for them. And so we understand that the message of the book of Genesis is primarily to the Jewish people. It's a, it's a message to the people, especially the people that are in the land at that time. There's always a message in it for us as well. But the, one of the messages that, that, that we should extract from this is that Jacob was the one through whom the blessings were made to Abraham. And, and all, of, all, of those, all of the Israelites in the wilderness were descendants of Jacob. And as such, they're recipients not of not, not, not just descendants, but they're also recipients of the promises. So the, the more important lesson for them and for us is that God's faithfulness does not depend upon the faithfulness of his people. That, that when God is, he, God is always faithful, regardless of what we do. Now, God calls us to holiness and righteousness and truth. But God's faithfulness does not depend upon that. And I'm, I got to tell you, I'm really thankful for that. Because, you know, every now and then, about once every seven or eight years, I'm unfaithful. I make a mistake. I blow it. Maybe it's seven or eight minutes. I don't remember which one it was. God had promised something to Jacob. When they were in the womb, the promise was made to Jacob. It would be through him that the promises of God would flow. This, the, the promises that will ultimately lead to the Messiah, to the Savior, to the Christ, to Jesus. The, the, he's the one through whom those blessings will flow. Isaac knew that. Isaac knew what God had promised. What God had said. And, and he thought that God was making a mistake. He must have thought God was making a mistake. He must have thought that because he says, no, that's not the way it's supposed to go. It's supposed to go this way. Not go to the younger. It's supposed to go to the older. You know, Esau's older by you know, seven minutes, but he's still the older. It's supposed to go to him. Rebecca knew that. She knew what the truth was. She knew what God had said because God had said it to her directly. She didn't believe that God could do it without her help. I got to help God to do it. Jacob knew it. Jacob knew what God had said. And he allowed himself to be manipulated by his mother to deceive his father. To dishonor him. Esau knew that. He knew. Everybody knew. But he was indifferent to it until his material blessings were involved. It was God's plan to bless Jacob. It was God's plan. And we see that blessing being enacted. Now, he was always going to be the one through whom these blessings would pass. Now, we might look at this text and say, well, you know, the ends justify the means, right? No, wrong. It was the wrong way. You know, God caused all this to happen. Right? That's another thing. God caused it to happen that way. Uh, no. No, he didn't. It is contrary to God's nature to cause us to sin to accomplish his will. He cannot do that. He won't do that. He's going to accomplish his will, and he may do it in spite of our sin, but he'll never, ever lead us to sin to accomplish his will, ever. James 1, 13 to 14 says this, let no one, no one, who is that? No one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. God made me do it. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. It might be a surprise to some, but God does not need your help. Doesn't need your help. 
Anytime we get involved trying to accomplish God's will, trying to, do, trying to accomplish God's will our way, we're messing something up. We're just messing it up. Rebecca thought she was helping God. It's not what she was doing. She was interfering. And she paid a steep price for it. Personally, she paid a steep price. I believe, while we don't get a sense of how long all this took, but my sense is that chapter 28 is immediately after chapter 27. It is in my Bible, so I'm assuming that's actually how it happened. But, but chronologically, it was the same day. As, as Jacob takes the blessing, Esau says, I'm going to kill him. Rebekah goes to Isaac and says, we gotta get we got to get Jacob out of here. That night, he left. And you know what? She never saw him again. Never saw him again. Her favorite, by the way, the Bible tells us her favorite son left, and she never saw him again. And may not have had any idea what was happening to him out there. Not only did she pay a steep price, but God's people paid a steep price as well as Esau would ultimately, as I said earlier, be the, the ancestor of the Edomites and all the suffering that they brought upon the people of Israel. Jacob's going to pay a price as well. As he, as he goes away, and he has some pretty radical experiences with God, but he's going to end up at Uncle Laban's house. Or is that Uncle Laban? No. Whatever he is, brother-in-law Laban's house. And Laban deceives him at least ten times. Somehow this family's faith was weak. It had started well, but it finished poorly. Warren Wearsby said, faith is living without scheming. And faith means obeying God no matter how we feel, what we think, or what might happen. Obeying God is, depends on nothing from within us. It's just doing what God says. If we allow our emotions, our feelings, our thoughts, our perspectives to interfere with obeying God, then we are in sin. And there's no other way of saying it. God has made great and precious promises to all of us, and they are sure. We can depend upon them, and we will never have to sin to get them, ever. We never have to compromise. And brothers and sisters, I, I, my, heart is, my heart is grieved about what I see going on in churches. Churches are compromising their faith. What do we do? We trust God. That's what we're called to do. We're called to trust God to keep his word. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. In all your ways, acknowledge him. How do we do that? Through obedience. We obey. That's how you acknowledge God. Okay, God. Okay, God said it. I believe it. That settles it. I'm doing it. And if we will do that, we're acknowledging God, and he will direct our paths. He will get us to where he wants us to be. He'll get us to the fulfillment of the promises he made to us. We don't have to connive. We don't have to deceive. We don't have to manipulate the situation. We just go and, 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 and listen. That's not going to be easy because God. there's some times where God is going to stretch you and test you and make you wait for things that you are going to think, I need to do something here. But God isn't going to tell you what. You know why he's not telling you what? Because he doesn't want you to do anything right now except to wait and trust him. Trusting and obeying God will call you to ignore your natural desires. It will call you to disregard what your flesh is telling you. True faith will take you places where your flesh doesn't want to go, especially into the area of waiting. Or it'll tell you, it'll take you places where your flesh will tell you you can't go. God's will never leads where his grace cannot protect and provide 
and keep us. Now, now there's no way that we can know how the blessing would have passed to Jacob if Rebekah had not interfered. But I can promise you this, it would have still come to Jacob. We just don't know how. Even though Isaac was planning to do what he was planning to do, the blessing would have still gone to Jacob because it was his, and God would not have allowed it to go any other way. Listen, I think some of us, maybe, maybe no one here, maybe somebody who will watch later on, you know, we, we get to this place where we think we have to do something. And what God's telling you to do is telling you to wait. He's telling you to wait for him. And what do you do while you wait? Well, the best thing you can do while you're waiting for God to tell you what to do is to get to know him better. Get to know him better. Because there's a chance that there's something in this that he's waiting for you to know, to learn, to discover, to obey. Isaac's whole family ends up suffering because of this incident. And that's the thing that I think we need to catch out of this, all of us, especially if you're, if you're in a family, which we all are. Our impatience, our unwillingness to wait for God is going to cost our family something. This family was never the same after this. You must be careful. Be careful when you start being tempted to help God. Because it can have widespread and long-lasting effects. What should we do? Trust God. Obey him. Get to know him. If you're not sure what to do, then pray. Number one, pray. We're going to say that over and over and over again. What's the first thing you ought to do? Pray. What should you do next? Pray again. And then you get into your word. You get into the word and you pray. You get into the word and you pray. You get into the word and you pray. And you keep waiting until you hear God tell you something. And if you're still not sure, then, then God puts us in families, but then he puts us in the family of God. He puts us in the church. And he surrounds us with people that are wiser and smarter and more informed about these things than we are. And we ought to be depending upon one another for the help that we need. And we find ourselves in this place. I know, I, th I think I'm supposed to be doing something, but I don't know what it is. Get, some, get around somebody who can help you discover what that thing is. Pray. Get into his word. And then learn to trust God. And when he calls you to obey, obey. Regardless of what your flesh is telling you, regardless of what your friends are telling you, regardless of what your spouse might be telling you, do what God says. And if you do all those things, if you're praying and you're seeking God's word and you're getting counsel and you're still not sure, what should you do? Wait. And start over again. Pray. Get into his word. And you keep doing that until God does something. Because he will. He will every single time. Remember, God's will is absolutely certain. Even when we are unfaithful, God is always faithful. So you find yourself, I'm not sure what to do, God. If, he, if he's not telling you something, which he, he, sometimes he'll be quiet and see if you'll just trust him. If he doesn't actually tell you something, then you just wait and believe. God's going to do something. I don't know what, but he's going to do something, so I'm just going to wait until he does. Well, don't just wait. Pray, get into the word, get to know him better, get around God's people, and then just believe. His promises never fail. Believe it and be blessed. Amen? Amen? Heavenly Father, we come and we're thankful for, Lord, your grace, your mercy, your love. And we thank you, Lord God, that your promises are certain, that there is no, there is no question that whether or not you're going to keep your word or not. 
That, that is an absolute certainty. And we need to get ourselves in that place where we are so absolutely convinced in our heart that you will keep your word that we absolutely, it becomes the very foundation upon which we build our day, knowing that there is nothing of your word that will fail. Not even one little tiny bit of what you say will fail. We must believe that is true. But to truly believe that, we need to know what you say. And we do that through your word. We do that through prayer, by, by communing with the Holy Spirit, allowing the Holy Spirit to minister to our heart through prayer, through the word, through fellowship with others, through serving others, through the giving of ourselves and our things. Lord, all of those things draw us in that place of knowing you better. And the better we know you, the better we hear you. And the better we hear you, the more easily it is for us to obey you. And Lord, when we start to know you, we can. We, it's easier for us to trust you and obey you. When we know you better, it's easier for us to wait when our flesh is telling us to go and to do. And I pray, Lord, for us, your people, that we be a people that be quick to trust, that we would be quick to obey, that we would be quick to wait if you tell us to wait, and that we would know that no matter what happens, that even when we are unfaithful, you will be unfaithful. Even when all those around us are unfaithful, you will be faithful. And so I pray for these, your people, a great outpouring of your Holy Spirit, that we would trust you with every fiber of our being, that we would lean into you with, with every action, every thought, every behavior, every, everything that we do, Lord God, would be, would, be, would be to draw ourselves closer to you, that we might be able to walk with you more fully, that we might be able to obey you more quickly, that we might be able to wait for you more patiently, that, Lord God, that we would know, that we would know that your will will be done and that knowing that we would have peace and that we would we would just wait knowing that the God of the universe who loves us so much that he would send his own son to die on our behalf know that you care for us and that you will care for us and Lord as we as we sit here today we pray Lord if there's anyone that is here or can hear my voice Lord, if they, if they don't know you, they don't have that relationship with you, that none of these things might even make sense right now. Because it takes, it takes your spirit, God, to make these things make sense. And Lord, there's, there's a reality that, that, that we can't wait for you if we don't know you. And so I pray if there's anyone that does not have a relationship with you, that right this very moment they would open their hearts to receive from you. That they would recognize that, that, that as Esau lacked repentance, the one thing he needed, that he might be able to, to, to be a different person. And if they would just repent and recognize that they need you, God, they would receive Jesus as their Savior because he is their Savior. He is your Savior. He died for your sins. And he was born, he was raised from the dead that you might be born again. You might live eternally with him. To receive that free gift, you must open your heart. Acknowledge that you need God because your sins have alienated you from him. And ask him to come in. To cleanse you of your sin. And to help you live a life that is good and right and holy do that and the Bible promises that you will be saved and I pray Lord for all of us Lord God that we would that we would go forward from this place Lord Lord out into the darkness Lord that this this world is getting darker by the minute that we would go out into the darkness as as candles as lights as beacons of truth and as Randy and I talked before the service, we are living in a time where there is a famine of truth. People are doing what they want to do because that's what they want to do. Lord God, we are, that we carry the truth with us. Lord, let us do it boldly. God, we wait for you to do what you're going to do, Lord. Help us to be busy about the ministry of the gospel. We thank you. And we give this day to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We can pray with you, please. Come, let us pray with you.
Thank you for joining us on this exciting journey through the book of Genesis. We publish these messages as an expression of our love and worship of God. It's our desire that they would glorify God, bless others, and grow faith. If there's anything that we can do to help you on your journey of faith, please do not hesitate to reach out and connect to us. The best way to do that is by going to ccfv.life slash connect. There you'll find all the different ways that you can connect to us. As Christians, we are already connected in Christ. And one of the ways that we would like to engage with you is in the area of prayer. If you would like us to pray for you, please send your prayer request to prayer at calvaryfv.com or text the word pray to 951-419-5396. If this material has been useful to you, please leave a comment or review this channel or don't forget to subscribe to it so that you don't miss other things that we publish. Also, please pray that God would use these messages to help others find hope in Jesus Christ. You can also partner with us financially by going to calvaryfv.com slash give or text the word give to 951-419-5396. Until next time, go be radical with Jesus.